Hey, listen, uh, reiterate, this is a can't miss deal maker stuff. You've heard this from us many, many times. Take the time. We're, we're keeping these things about a half hour each. Okay, so today's guest, um, more than a guest. When we started Court Club many, many years ago, mm -hmm. it was, I met Nate Harris. Uh, he was a guy who was an intense learner, wanted to, as much information as he could get, as much and as quickly as possible. As I got to know him even better, he's a really deep guy. He's a, he's a man of faith. He's strong with his family, loves the game, uh, has all this in perspective. But what it came down to that really got my attention here was that he was one of the few referees that I ever met that they came forward and said, you know, there's an area here that I need help, mental skills, and he reached out. Uh, and he found a, a, a gentleman, Brian Kane, who he'll talk about, who helped him. And I, the same analogy I draw with Joe Crawford. You know, you folks have heard me talk about how Joe, at the end of his career, knew that he needed Dr. Joel Fish, and he needed somebody he could talk to on a regular basis to kind of help him navigate through the day-to-day, -day, the challenges that we have. So a real living example in Nate's career has reflected uh, the great work that he's done and really, he's made himself uh, into a tremendous referee, and it's an inside-out deal. So uh, Nate Harris from up there in the northwest in the Spokane area, also a great trainer. You get a chance to uh, go to his camp or be around him. You know that he's a tremendous teacher. So I'm going to jump into this, Nate, right away. So what got your attention way back when, when you were trying to figure this thing out, and you, and you got to the point where you said, gee, maybe somebody else could help me other than just a basketball person, maybe something somebody could help me with my mental skills. What was it that got you to that point? Well, first of all, I want to say uh, thank you to you and to Rob and the entire Court Club family. Um, you know, I would not be the official that I am today um, if it weren't for Court Club. You know, all of us are seeking to find new information. And um, back when um, not all this information was readily at our fingertips, I know we've talked about that, uh, numerous times um, I was searching on the internet trying to find more information I just wanted as much information as I possibly could get and uh, I stumbled across the uh, basketball officiating success system um, oh. had to get my wife to agree to to let me buy it back then um, we were still in college didn't have a lot of money um, but she said yeah you want to do this so let, so and she's so supportive and, and said yes let's go do that and so signed up for it and uh, little did I know there'd be a big uh, impact and change in my career uh, being able to get that information uh, through the court club. So thank you to you, Ed. Thank you to Rob. And, and Rob and I were starting around the same time in the court club. So it's pretty neat to see um, where this has evolved along with Tyler Ford and many of the other members that, um, you know, that just continue the, the growth. It's so cool to see that. But um, when we talk about uh, the mental training part of officiating, um, to me, this is a, an area, and, and I'm really happy that you're doing a series on it because we do not talk about this enough. Um, a couple of years ago, well, probably about three, four years ago, my brother uh, was the baseball coach at Quincy High School where we grew up, my hometown. Um, and my brother, like me, always trying to find new uh, and improved ways to, to be better with his coaching and to, to make his athletes better, um, he stumbled across Brian Kane. And uh, Brian Kane is a sports psychologist, um, a mental performance coach, uh, has worked with several different high profile athletes, UFC fighters, and that kind of stuff. And so, my brother actually had me sit in, and I've always been interested in this. In fact, back in high school, um, Ken Revisit cassette tapes were around, um, and we actually listened, my brother and I listened to him. Now, did we apply the information like we should have? Probably not, but we listened to a couple of the tapes uh, in our small little farming town that we grew up in with Ken Revisa. Well, Ken Revisa, little did I know, I graduated in 2003, little did I know, he was actually mentoring Brian Kane at the time, and that our paths would cross down the road, so kind of a small world. Um, but my brother had this um, session that Brian Kane had put together on his 12 Pillars of Peak Performance, and I sat in on it with my brother. I just sat in and listened to the information. So I started taking that information, and I started trying to uh, apply the info. But um, it was working okay, but I didn't have all the insights. And I'm like, you know what, I need to take, my, take myself to the next level here in this mental performance. But it wasn't until I actually had a tough situation. I got an evaluation probably... I think it was uh, almost two and a half years ago um, that I wasn't happy with. Um, I got feedback that was honest and correct, um, but I would really have a problem with internalizing that feedback and letting it uh, paralyze me almost and, and 
um, mentally, paralyzed me mentally. And so I, I remember it vividly. I think I was in Los Angeles. I can't remember. I was at a hotel. I called my wife and I said, hey, uh, Brian offers this one-on-one -on -one coaching. This is January three years ago or two years ago. I can't remember exactly when. Um, but, and said, I really would like to do this one-on-one -on -one coaching. Now, the investment in one-on-one -on -one coaching with somebody like that uh, is not an in inexpensive endeavor. Um, but I knew that I was, that was the missing link, you know, missing link. I had heard my brother and seen it applied in all these different areas. And, um, but I didn't know all the step-by-step -step processes that were going to get me to where I needed to go in that mental performance route. And I needed somebody to help me get focused on, uh, on the process of what we do, which is what we love. That's why we're all a part of court club and that kind of stuff. The process versus the outcome. Right. And, and little did I know that that was going to be a, a game changing phone call. Um, he'd never worked with a referee before. Um, so that was a pretty neat uh, experience for him. That's why he was so excited to do it. Um, and for me, it's been a game changer. And, and I will say this and I'll touch more on it as we go along, but it's not just a game changer in officiating for me. It's been a game changer in my daily life, in my family, in my relationships. There's been so many of the things that he's talked about in my day job that have helped me um, in all those different areas, not just uh, in officiating. But it was really a, a, an area where I had a problem. I, I had a, a need, an issue, and I needed to address that um, and really figure out a way to deal with that internal uh, angst that I was dealing with. Yeah, so, Nate, uh, <clears throat> I'm hearing you say that you were influenced by this feedback you got um, to the point where there was a little voice back here that was working on you and it wasn't so good because of this feedback. And in a way it was kind of, you were kind of beating yourself up and, and certainly, you know, conversation with your wife. Look, so you, you're you a, a person who recognizes influencers. So it seems to me like you took the negative feedback and then you kind of replaced it with an influencer that would navigate you through those situations. Because I'm sure that that's, not the last time you got that kind of feedback. It's kind of part of what happens to us, right? And right, absolutely. And, and, and you know, Ed, the, the, the thing is, is that all of us have um, a story, okay? And, and in the faith community, and I, I, you know, I'm a Christian, and I live, try to live that out as much as I possibly can. Um, I, all of us have a story to tell, okay? And so back in my childhood, there were some things that had happened that were, were not the best. And so... Um, nothing crazy, but just, just not the best home environment all the time. And I had really learned that that stuff had um, affected me, not just in um, my daily life, but also in refereeing. And, and so I would internalize that stuff. I was a people pleaser. I wanted to make everybody happy. Um, if I wasn't right, I was a perfectionist, right? Um, if you have these situations where you get really tense, and we'll talk about yellow and red lights here in a little bit, when you get to a yellow or a red light state, I would try to become mm. perfect. Um, you know, and all, especially coming up through, and um, you talked with uh, Bob Pukesbury about the um, camp environment. I mean, I would go to these camp, these tryout camps, and I would, I have to be perfect. I got to, you know, and, and I learned uh, later on as I started to work with Brian and um, started to really flush out some of the stuff is that um, those instances from my past, I was trying to be a perfectionist. I was trying to um, make up for some of that. And so, um, as he started to work with me on this stuff, I realized that we have to really live in this present moment that we're in. We have to live in the present moment, take our negative thoughts, turn them into positive thoughts. You have a choice. Every thought that comes through your mind, you have a choice. You can choose to live in that thought because your mind doesn't know the difference between, you've, you've heard all these people talk about it. Your mind doesn't know the difference between whether that's a real thing that's actually happening in your life or whether that's just a thought. Your mind perceives that it's real. And so if we're buying into this negative thought process that continues to spiral, and that's what had happened. I had taken this, this evaluation that I had got that really wasn't that bad, <laughs> but I had taken it and I had internalized it because we love what we do. We love what we do. You wouldn't be in court club if you didn't. Um, we love what we do. We want to be the best. And, and let me tell you, being the best is be the best you can be, not compared to these other people right? You have to compare what did you do yesterday and how much better can you become today? And that's what you do with those negative thought processes. And, and we can, we can talk a little bit more about that. Dave, think about this for a second. I want to, so you go to camps or you were given opportunities and the door would crack open this far. And so 
maybe there was a voice there from Nate Harris because of your background and your, and your life growing up. Hey, I'm going to prove it. I'm going to prove that I belong here. Trust me, mm -hmm. I'm going to do this. As I call it a, a prove it referee. Right? So you were kind of like out of your natural state, you would do things that maybe you normally would not have done because you're out there trying to prove it. You're like, you know, you're, you're up the plate, you're squeezing the bat, you're trying to be perfect. Um, no doubt. No that's, doubt. That kind of plays out. That's a tough place to be. It's a really, it's a really hard place to be. And especially, um, you know, when you want to become a division one referee, you want to referee in the NBA, you want to get to that next level, whatever that level is for you. You can be a high school guy trying to get into college basketball. Um, you know, we were talking the other day before we got on here about, I was really getting away from the fun of this, right? Which is the video breakdown, which is the rules study, which is the refereeing the games that we love to referee. I was getting away from that because I was so focused on this out here. I have to do this. I have to do this. Yeah. That um, I didn't live in a process based uh, environment. I did early on in my career, right? Early on as we were, you know, when you're trying to acquire information and become a core club member, all that kind of stuff, I was trying to get as much info as possible. You live there. And then after, it was funny, after I got hired in Division One basketball, it's like, now I got to work more games. Mm -hmm. Now I need more games. Now I need more, I got to get in the D League. I got to, whatever it was, I, I mean, all of those things where I have to do this and I would view it as failure if I didn't get there. And so as opposed to taking failure and looking at it as positive feedback, if you get a chance to write that down, look at failure as positive feedback. Mm -hmm. If you can change that environment, that Ooh. thought process uh, in, in there, and take that failure as positive feedback, then you're going to be able to internalize that and figure out what's the next step in the process. Sure. Uh, you know, I think we said years ago, there's a visual, fail forward. Yes. Um, yeah. And you know, in other words, if I get stuck in that place, I got to find a way to go forward. Because, you know, I have to tell you, um, like watching your, you progress, and I think the thing that just jumps up at me that is the result of all this work was when you did get an opportunity to work the NC2A tournament. And, and uh, that was one of those things like, wow, Nate got a chance to work the NC2A tournament. And J.D. Collins believed in you. And you know, as well as I do, because I watch you personally, you nailed it. You acted as if you'd been there for five years. That had to, that had, that had to be tremendously gratifying it probably wouldn't have happened if you had not unraveled all this stuff and spent this time and built a foundation. So that had to be fun. To go out and well, do that. it was it was a great experience, and every year when when you get selected, it, it's a great experience. It's an honor, and um, it's something you know. It's funny. Um, you can't put those games up on a pedestal, though. So anytime you get these right and. and um, now, let me tell you what, when I got that phone call and, you know, you, the elation and the, when you walk out on the floor for the first time, there's nothing like it. I, I don't want to, to, you know, downplay it. It's an unbelievable honor and experience to be able to be out there and, and referee those games. And many people would love to be in my shoes. And, and I, so I'm so thankful and, and it's an honor to do it. Um, but the big thing is when it's, and you used to talk about this, but when you, when you step into that next environment or that next step in your career that whatever that is you have to referee like you were refereeing and and i will say this um boba roski who many of you know um yeah. was on the game with me and he came over to me in the pregame and i'll never forget this he says the first couple minutes are going to be a little bit different but you're going to settle right in and it's going to be like the other 60 that you refereed all year and that little and, and he goes and you're going to do a great job and that little piece and i will never forget that i've always <laughs> Uh, that's something that as I continue to grow, it's what I want to tell other people is like that. You know what? This is basketball. Let's go out and referee it. And I think that that gets back to what we're talking about. Enjoy the process. Enjoy the moment. Don't make the moment uh, too big. And you've heard all the different sports psych guys that you've talked through, that you talked to throughout this talk about that. Right. And, and then it's funny when that game's over with that game's over with, you need to process it just like you process any other game. Yeah. Just you like know, you process any other game. And it's, you get, and we'll, we'll get into that um, as we go along here. Well, I'm sorry for interrupting, but I, I, I came and talking to Joe Crawford about this. Like, Bo was a guy that instantly your mind said, oh, he believes in me. We all yeah. need that now. We, we need some of the people that are going to believe in me because that's, that is foundational. I mean, when we have our faith, but certainly we need to know 
with certain people because the other voices are there also, so we have to manage that. Um, because as we move up the ladder, not everybody's rooting for us for different reasons. We have to find a way to kind of really diffuse all that and lean on the thoughts that come to us in our mind of those who believe in it. So, the, you know, I, I mean, I know that's the kind of personality you are. And just sometimes the little comments that, that somebody makes like sinks in and it becomes a, a springboard for people to, to go forward. Um, so let, let's, uh, I know you've got a lot of material here. That because you've gone through so much education, um, and I know you could, you probably could have taken this whole course and taught it uh, from beginning to end. But um, let's kind of give the members some some exposure to some of the things that influenced you through the teachings of, of Brian. And uh, and I, it's exciting to hear Ken Rubinson because you know he was one of the guys that kind of jump started me in thinking about this. And back in June of fifteen. We did a one-hour audio interview with him, which we're going to share sometime later with the members. But uh, that, that's impactful stuff. Yeah, it, it, and uh, and Brian would would tell you that um, Ken had a tremendous impact. He actually studied under him at, at Cal State Fullerton. So, um, as as we go along here, so what I what I'm going to kind of lay out for you uh, as core club members is kind of the process that um, I went through and that I still go through and that I use in my. Um, not just in basketball officiating, we'll keep it tailored to that, but there'll be some in, uh, areas in here that will definitely impact your life. Um, so I wanna talk about goal setting to start out. Um, so if you don't write down your goals, and I'm hoping that many of you that are in the core club are doing that, but if you haven't written down your goals, um, they're not going to be accomplished. And, and I will say that because, and you need to have them in a place where you can view them daily. Um, Earl Nightingale used to talk about the strangest secret and he had, you know, asked people to write things down where you want to be um, and actually look at that and envision it and believe it every single day. Um, and so that's what, what we do with the goal setting process. And so um, Brian walked me through what he calls his MVP process. And I'm going to share my screen here and kind of show you all what that looks like, what the MVP process will look like. Um, and, and how you can use this possibly uh, in your officiating uh, career. So if you look at this, this is my officiating MVP process that I uh, put together on 9-23-19. I usually update it every quarter um, and then in the off season and then during the basketball season, I will actually update this, um, this information every month or two. Um, so if you can look up here, it says 9-23 is when I put it together to be updated on uh, November 24th. So I'm going to go through the first month of the season and kind of get to the end of it and decide, okay, what do I need to work on and, and from that first month of the season and, and create a new one for December and January. And then we go into February and March and I, I do a couple different ones throughout the season. But if you look at this life mission, this is what you want read um, at your funeral. Okay, okay, so so if you can read what my life mission is here, it's live a biblically based life uh, with God at the center, be a servant leader for with Jess, Grayson, and Riley. Those are my my wife and my kids, my family, and all those around me by giving them my present moment focus at all times. Live a life focused on others by impacting their lives daily in each area: family, officiating, work, and church, and resist being self centered. So those are. You know, that's what I want read at my funeral. That's what my focus in, in my everyday life will be. And then as we continue to move along down to this next section here, this is your vision. So now we're getting a little bit more specific. And if you look here, I put telescope goals. So telescope versus microscope. A telescope is uh, way out there in the distance, right? This is what we want to accomplish. But then we have to work backwards. We have to get into um, <clears throat> our process-based goals and get to the microscope of it which is what are we going to do today to get to that telescope goal? So if you look at these, and I put on here outcome-based because these are all out of my control. Grayson and Riley become Christ followers is one of my goals. Referee the NCAA second round. Referee Sweet 16 Elite Eight Final Four. Train 1,000 referees so they can take the training and train others. Uh, ben hired in Division One, and Josh hired in the G League. Those are a couple guys that I, uh, that I mentor here in Spokane, Justin Shamian as well. Uh, mentors those guys as well and then make an impact by God's kingdom by building relationships with others I want you to look at these though these are a lot of things that are out of my control okay so I can't control whether my son or daughter become Christ followers I can impact them I can't control that that's their decision right I can't control whether I referee the NCAA second round next year that's JD's decision okay that all those different things 
and been hired in Division One and Josh in the G League. I want that to happen, but that's not in my control. Other people make those decisions. So if you look at the bottom, I put this in quotes because it's something for me to remind myself every time I look at this every day, small plan steps executed daily will make me succeed. So I now get into the process pay, place goals that um, from this mission and vision and trying to live those out every single day. We're not gonna go through each one of these, um, but this is the stuff that I'm working on every single day to get myself to where I want to be in those telescope goals. So if you look, I, I've broken it down into different um, sections of what we do. And I think these pretty much cover all of the things that we uh, do in officiating. So if you look at it, rules, 15 minutes of rules casebook per day, five times per week. You make sure these are realistic. Is it realistic that I'm gonna be in my book every single day, seven days a week with the family commitments I have? Probably not. So five days a week is realistic, okay? Mechanics. Mental training and mindset, video, communication, and fitness. Those are all areas that are critical to what we're doing, okay? And if you look at the top, it says must be on your 168. So we're going to talk about that next as we move into the next step of this is I actually use a 168 plan where uh, every hour of the week is planned out. Now, you have to adapt and adjust in that, but every hour of the week is planned out. So then I get more specific here. So... You know, an area of focus for me is constantly coach communication. How can I get better with that? Um, so if you look here, close the gap, communicate, and separate. That's something that I was working on. That was feedback that I received um, in one of my evaluations. So how am I doing that? Voice and projection during dead ball. Close the gap when communicating with players and coaches. And then separate, right? Relax my facial uh, expressions. That's something that's really, really big for me. Um, I have a tendency when the game starts, I just look really, really focused and really intense all the time, okay? Well, what am I doing? This summer when I was riding my bike, um, I got a mountain bike this summer. When I was riding my bike, I'm climbing hills and doing these different things, intense things on your bike. And I, would, I actually noticed, I was aware that my face would get clenched up. Well, during that, I started to relax my face, right? And, and try and notice when you're working scrimmages, when you're working, okay? That's stuff you should focus on. And then I get into my mechanics focus, my fitness focus, my mental training focus, right? My video focus. These are things in October and November that I'm going to focus on. And then we'll talk about this near the end, but then I'm going to use well, better, and how. What did I do well? What could I have done better? How am I going to uh, implement those fixes at the end of November? I'll evaluate and then put together a new MVP process. One thing I don't want you to miss here is this family vision for the season. We all are crazy busy mm -hmm. from November to March. Um, and I'll tell you right now, I was crazy busy after that this summer. I went to seven camps. Okay. So you have to actually intentionally schedule that time with your family. So if you look in here, date night with Jess one time per month in season. And I write in the parentheses schedule. Because if I don't schedule it, we're not going to do it. Nightly family time when home. No phone. I'm blocking out that time frame. And I'll show you guys that in a minute. Check in with my family uh, via FaceTime. Part of my pregame routine is actually that. Send video in the morning and evening to the kids. Just a little pick-me-up, right? Whatever that is uh, uh, for them. But this is the MVP process. So this is goal-oriented. It may seem very cumbersome to some of you. I've showed this to a couple of our guys. And I said, well, simplify it. I've been doing this stuff for almost three years now. Simplify it. Don't put as many things in there, okay? Um, and start working on that. So that is what we call our, our MVP process. Um, and then I'll, I'll go into step number two here real quick, and, and then um, we can pause for a question or whatever, Ed. But the, the next one is the 168 plan. So if I pull up this 168 plan, um, I'm going to, let's see if that'll work here. Uh, let me share the screen again. Sorry about that. Okay, so here's the 168 plan. So I look at what's my most important task for the day. I put a little Bible verse at the top for me, just so it reminds me to serve others daily, um, Matthew 25, 40. Um, but then as we go along here, here's the to-do list, right? Um, the MDI is where I work, so that's my day job. Those are the three things that are most important for today. Officiating, uh, obviously you can see on there, prepare for court club call with Ed and Rob, okay? So this morning I was really focusing on, uh, I wanted to have this stuff planned out for you guys so it wasn't just thrown together. Mm -hmm. um, all the other stuff within officiating. Then family and personal. Schedule date night with Gray and Riley for November. Okay, what, what night are we going to do that around all these basketball games? Be present at Grayson's baseball game tonight. It's actually a practice, but I put game in there for some reason. Baseball practice tonight. Don't take my phone. 
leave my phone in the car, actually be there with my son and watch him play baseball. Um, and then Bible reading plans. So the, these are all things. And then as you look here, this is, this is just an example of what today looks like. Now, I've, I put this together on Sundays. So for the previous week, I'll put it together on Sundays. 5.30 a.m. wake up call, T25 workout. Then here's my morning routine, gratitude journal, optimize, meditate, read the Bible and pray, and then rules for 10 minutes. And this is all planned out. Um, one thing I want you all to get here is the success hotline I listen to every day on my way uh, to the office. And this is something Brian turned me on to. Uh, Dr. Rob Gilbert from Montclair State University gives a three-minute message on a phone number every single day. And I'll give you guys the number here um, as we go along. Now, let's see here. This is the phone number if you guys want to write it down for the success hotline every day. It's a three-minute message, and it's all about success and positivity. And uh, I usually get something from it every morning. So it's uh, one nine seven three seven four three four six nine zero. Well, repeat that, please. Yeah, one nine seven three seven four three four six nine zero, and that's for the success hotline. Good. Um, and so, so the cool part about that is that it's just a positive thing um, in your car. Uh, as, as I'm getting ready to start the day, it really, really gets me going. But as you can see, this so pretty much everything is laid out here. Because if, let me tell you this, what you schedule gets done. If it's not scheduled, you're not going to do it. And you have to have these different triggers that are trigger your routines, we'll talk about in just a minute. But what you schedule gets done. So if I don't write here, prepare for court club call, write out process in notebook, have documents on desktop and ready to go, I'm not, I'm not going to be prepared to come in here and, and talk with you guys. So that's, that's the MVP process and uh, the 168 plan. And um, we can go into routines here in a minute, Ed, if you'd like. Yeah. So. Hey, let me ask you, uh, uh, something jumped up in you there. Was your gratitude journal? Mm -hmm. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. Uh, tell me about that. And when you do that, tell me about kind of like how that makes you feel. Yeah, that's a great question. Um, it's gratitude is a great um, replacement for negativity, uh, for anxiety, all those sorts of things that we experience. And Brian calls it a compared to what mentality. So a lot of times, um, you know, you look at, I want more games. I want this. Okay, well, compared to what, right? I mean, look, look at somebody else that's working less games than you or would love to be where you're at. So when you get into that gratitude moment, it doesn't give you the opportunity to get negative. It makes me feel, I do it every morning. Um, and a lot of it is, you know, grateful for my wife for all she did for us yesterday. Grateful for, you know, Grayson and Riley and the joy they bring me every day. Um, you know, like if I was writing tomorrow, it's going to be grateful for the opportunity to talk to Core Club. Um, and then that just, any time that you feel yourself going into that negative mindset, if you can turn it around and be grateful for what you have, I mean, I'm sitting in a house right now that I never thought I would have. Um, I, I have a family that I never thought I would. I'm okay, so grateful. If we, if we can turn to that gratitude, you know, be grateful for the leagues that you referee in. Yeah. Uh, be grateful for the opportunities you've had to this point. If you can turn to that gratitude piece of it, it is really um, an antidote for getting rid of these, you know, these, these negative thought processes that come in. And if you start your day like that, I like to start my day like that because – um, you start your day like that, it really gets your eyes focused on, on where they need to be. Hey, if you'll allow me, I'm going to add something there that I just learned this past year. Uh, I heard a commencement speak by the Chief Justice. Chief Justice of the United States gave this commencement speak, uh, speech to a, to a uh, middle school boys in uh, Washington, D.C. And in the middle of the speech, he talked about gratitude. And, you're thinking, and he, told, he challenged them with an action step. He said, once a week, Take a thank you card and think about somebody who has influenced your life, somebody who has done some things that have helped you along the way. Take that thank you card and say, dear Joe, dear Mr. So-and-so, and it's four or five sentences, how much I appreciate that they being so meaningful to me. Thank you, bum, bam, mail. Now, that's, that's pretty progressive in today's world of texting and whatever. Yeah. So, and, and, and I so, um it's kind of a thing that I put on my list that I've started to do. And it's amazing how when you put that envelope in the mailbox, that's like an action step. But man, that, that felt right. That was yeah. the right thing to do. 
it does feel right. And, and if we can just live in that world, I mean, cause if you continue to go down the negative spiral, um, it just, I mean, you, you know, telereph is a, is a, you know, yeah. tell, is, is a, is a really negative thing, right? We can get, in, and we've all done it. I've done it. We've all done it. And we can get really negative in this business. And, and just so you know, it's not just refereeing. Um, my wife tells me that we're like a bunch of high school girls. Um, but, but if we can, if we can quit living in that, uh, that world all the time, um, and really just focus on, you know, staying positive and, and being grateful for, for what we have. Um, I think it'll just make us, uh, it, it will make you be even more successful. I, I can, I can tell you that. So well, I think that it sets us apart they, when we start doing that because our world is, and I think around us constantly are people that are, we're just sitting around taking shots. Uh, oh, yeah. Yeah. In refereeing is in coaching. It's, you know, it's in all fields. Uh, you know, it's certainly the better you get at something and the more accomplished, the harder you work. It's kind of like, as you go up the mountain, there's more people that will do that. We have to find a way to manage that. And I think one of the reasons that gratitude thing is, uh, that's powerful. That, that's, yeah. 